Some, but not all of us. Um, for the last half of our program, we really want to focus on um, regional initiatives to both uh, preserve and build the missing middle. Um, and to do that, we're doing it in a Bokasha shop format, um, which I like to think of as the speed dating of um, presentation. Bokasha shop is uh, 20 slides presented at uh, 20 seconds each, and we told all of our presenters that they're auto time. Um, we've done this uh, to um, make the delivery of all of these really important regional initiatives um, as fun and engaging um, as we can, because we're all really doing really great work. We're all really passionate about it. Um, and if we force people uh, to present quickly, that passion really comes through. Um, <laughs> our Prakatisha um, presenters this afternoon, we have six of them, um, and they're most disciplinary, just like the audience here today. Um, we've got uh, advocates who are working on the ground to preserve the missing, the um, small building stock that we have, um, organizers as well. We have developers and architects that are um, planning to um, uh, build anew. Um, whatever the case, we have a lot of really important golf work going on around the region. Um, so I'm going to present each of our Prakachicha folks um, right before their presentation. Um, our first presenter is uh, Ethne McMenamin, <laughs> project, project manager um, uh, for Chicago Cottages. Uh, she leads the work in Chicago Cottages, a tiny home task force, a project of pride action tank. It works to bring new housing choices to those seeking additional solutions to the housing crisis. She has a women's legislative leadership project and previously served as the associate director of policy of the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we actually have two presenters. Um, the second presenter is Micah. Is that yes. <laughs> Micah does not have a bio, <laughs> but we are pleased to have both of them here today. All right, Ethne, um, I'm going to hand the microphone to you if you come up here. All right. And, uh, I'm coming up here? Yes. Okay. You're up. To the extent that I rehearsed at all, I did not rehearse with a 14-month-old on my back, so I'm just going to take out of so, um, so I figured the best place to start is just to give kind of an overview of tiny homes. What tiny homes, why tiny homes, who tiny homes, and where tiny homes. And hopefully included with all of that will be kind of an overview of the issue at large, but then also some more details about what we're doing specifically here in the Chicago area currently. So if you know about tiny homes, it's possible that this is what you kind of have in your mind. It's kind of twee, very cute, um, downsized, walking upon, upon the earth a bit more lightly kind of idea, um, sometimes very tricked out. You know, you can go you can go luxury with anything, right? You can spend a lot of money even if you're only living in you know 200 square feet um, if you truly want to, and, and 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 people do. And there's all kinds of you know HGTV kind of examples about that. So um, so that's a little bit of what tiny homes. Um, generally, we're talking between 100 and 400 square feet, but there's no definite definition. Um, sometimes you'll see them on wheels. A lot of times, our, again, in our HGTV kind of depiction of it, it's it's someone towing their very, very adorable little house behind them, um, having a lifestyle that allows them to somehow make a living and drive a car around the country at the same time. Um, <laughs> what maybe is a little bit less common are houses that are actually on foundations, so that aren't going to be moved from place to place, um, and that are just, you know, kind of smaller dwellings, right? Small footprint housing. Um, and if someone can come up with a Better name than tiny homes. Please see me. We need one. Um, so when um, when I started to ask, ask, try to answer the question why tiny homes, I, I googled why are tiny homes a good idea, and this is what came up: why are tiny homes a good idea? <laughs> Five reasons the tiny home movement is doomed to fail. You saw the all of those headlines were basically all like why this is a really bad idea. <laughs> um, but I'm here to tell you about why they might be a good idea. Um, so currently, as it stands, the model for getting affordable housing built, which we may have discussed already today before I arrived, is the average cost of an affordable unit is $350,000, and it takes three to five years to come online. Um, 
who are we, and by we I guess I mean me and my kind of compadres and partners in crime, talking about when we're talking about tiny homes is that it has a really flexible vision. There's a lot of words here, but you know, people who are interested in simplicity and sustainability, people who are interested in a housing that they can afford, people who are making twelve to fifteen dollars an hour, maybe the five to twenty-five thousand dollar a year income range, you know, maybe similar to an SRO renter, right? Um, where we want to focus on the main criteria being housing affordability. Here are some places around the country where this is being done currently. Just some examples. Um, this is Boneyard Studios in DC. Um, it's, it was just sort of three houses put up that face an alley in, in DC. And he doesn't like them either. I'm not really all that keen on this model. This is some architects. <laughs> they, just wanted, they wanted to just see what they could see about how to live a bit smaller. And, I mean, if, you, if you notice, there was actually an outhouse next door to, um, to their their houses, so obviously they aren't that practical. This is one of the first examples in the country of tiny homes done for affordability for a chronically homeless population that, um, where they wanted to help get people into more permanent settings. This is an example in Dallas called the Crossings at Hickory, the, sorry, the Cottages at Hickory Crossing. And it's uh, 50 units for people who are chronically homeless. It took 10 years to get it built. And I think that primarily had to do with the fact that it's a service-rich component. It has a very service-rich component. You can see this is kind of the overview. And what I'll just point out to you here is this is a fairly industrial area that they put this housing in. You see there's some warehouses in the background, and there's actually a huge highway that runs right along the side of this development. And so what that says to me is like <clears throat> it's on the outskirts, right? It's a little bit far away from the city center. This is an example of um, the tiny home work that they're doing in Detroit. Uh, <laughs> Cass Community Services um, in Detroit has built on single homes on single lots. They do not have a problem with land availability in Detroit, and so they're building one tiny home per lot. Not sure that's so practical for this area, but it's, it's getting us there, right? Um, this is actually um, Adeline Bone Baker's um, uh, ideas. Uh, Planet Bone Baker is an <coughs> architecture firm. And they, uh, sorry, they were, this is the Occupy Madison. This is the Occupy Madison um, development. So they're about, I think they're about 100 square feet, and they're up in Madison. And the Occupy folks kind of took it upon themselves. So they've got a very extremely simple, extremely small, tiny homes. Um, this is the current project that is slated to go forward and that we're hoping to break ground on in um, West Englewood in the spring of 2018. Um, the, the highlighted lots are six contiguous lots that we plan to build on that, the city, that are owned by the city currently that they're prepared to, to turn over to us to build um, with La Casa Norte, which is a local social service provider that serves homeless youth, um, and Pride Action Tank, which is the organization that I'm with. Um, and Landon Moon Baker is our architects and they're kind of a kind of the architects that are at the forefront of this space here in this area. Um, so this is like the layout of our, of our, um, of our area. Um, you can see we're, they're sort of done in, in sets of two, and then we've got a community building that has two additional units that are fully ADA accessible. So those are 500 square feet, and the other ones are 350 square feet. And we envision them again on six contiguous lots, um, at 63rd and Wood in West Englewood. So that's where we're at currently. These are some renderings that Linda Mo Baker has put together, some elevations um, of what of what this development is going to look like. And we're currently in the fundraising phase of this, um, so putting putting the money together for it. But um, by all accounts, it is going forward and it will happen. And so um, we're really really excited about that. Well, that was great. Thank you very much, both of you. <laughs> it was a team effort. Um, I'd like to uh, bring up our next Picasso um, presenter, uh, Elizabeth uh, McNicholas. Um, some of you heard from Elizabeth this morning um, introducing uh, our program for the day, um, but I'd like to reintroduce her to you all. Um, she is a principal at MGLM Architects and um, the firm's principal beauty maker. 
Having spent much of her adulthood learning to cope with chronic illness, uh, Elizabeth's sensitivities have given her distinct insights into the impact of the health environment on both human well-being and its opposite, stress. She and her partner, Matthew, have presented widely on the subject in recent years. Elizabeth holds a BA of Architecture and a Master's of Architectural Design and Urbanism from the University of Notre Dame. And she also holds a certificate in Neuroscience for Architecture from the New School of Architecture and Design. So I am going to load up the presentation here, and um, you're up. Okay, no one told me I couldn't have notes. And I'm too worked out and prone to not go with notes. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, all right, design matters. And I would um, add a subtitle to this. A few uh, good rules for middle housing design in the Midwest or anywhere, really. Um, and while my title and my day job claim that I'm an architect, I'm going to be giving this presentation from the standpoint of two other areas of experience. So um, there are a myriad of uh, uh, matters worth discussing when it comes to middle housing, such as zoning, codes, and financing, already discussed today. And those issues are the most relevant. Um, for instance, this was a 20-something unit uh, apartment building not far from here, um, and our friend owner, um, whose ample insurance policy couldn't pay to rebuild much of anything, so now it's parking lot. Um, so, uh, I have spent in the last decade a considerable amount of moonlighting time spent as a residential real estate broker. Um, as a realtor in Chicago, I've actually toured hundreds of middle housing units with my clients, and this opportunity may have actually been the big driver in why I took up real estate dating. So many of the images in my presentation here are lifted from real estate websites. Um, in real estate dating, as you hunt, you discuss, and the feedback on priorities and preferences in a winning home has been invaluable to my work as an architect. Um, there are a lot of universals. So in the two to three bedroom space, the courtyard or U type um, typology, is a strong winner, largely for the quality of the individual units it enables. So yes, well, you can see that in this example, the U-court may be 150 foot wide, equating to six standard Chicago lots, um, which, if there are three flats, could be 18 units, and the courtyard building could maybe fit 20 to 30. Um, please let's have a look inside this unit um, to see what makes these sorts of shapes um, such great spaces. So there's a very live, lively arrangement of rooms. Um, they can be very nice long window wall, um, hopefully there's a view into a courtyard with trees. You can get exposure usually on two or three or maybe in four sides, um, whereas there are some um, shortcomings when you come when you look at the two to three flat typology. So they can tend to be a little less sexy. You get the sort of bowling alley um, <laughs> hallways that are pretty typical. And while there may be uh, windows on both of the long walls, there's a good chance that you're looking at a brick wall. Um, now, what often happens, though, if you have architects involved, is that there are some sacrifices made. So say, you know, if you don't get enough light in this place, so let's make a deep sort of <laughs> eve overhang of one window that we do have, so you have even less light. Um, and probably I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that the neighborliness of this building is in question. I'm thinking the people who buy the walls on either side probably don't appreciate um, the monster that landed in its neighborhood. So then some architects will overcompensate. They realize that they're not getting a lot of light into these um, types of buildings. So then we um, solve the problem with big um, uh, sort of plate glass windows in the front. But the problem is once the buyers are inhabiting the building, they realize that they can't go to the kitchen in their underwear when it's after dark. <laughs> so whereas if you live in a house in a home like this, you can go to the kitchen naked after um, after hours. <laughs> These are the practical um, practicalities that we uh, hope that you're thinking about. So um, that's sort of the spiel from the real estate perspective, and now dabble in a little bit of neuroscience. So um, there have uh, been a whole world of scientific understanding opening up to us through recent developments in technology, such as wearable brain activity sensors, stress response monitors, and the ability to see what areas of the brain are firing in response to stimuli. And we've discovered many new things uh, just in the last decade. So your brain's navigational system is composed of grid cells and place cells. And grid cells are the neurons that fire when we hit a point in a certain pattern. It's actually a hexagonal pattern. And this graphic represents that pretty literally. Um, and then place cells, meanwhile, work hand in hand with the grid, grid cells and that they record and reinforce when we are in distinctive places. So um, during its millions of years of um, Evolution, the human brain didn't actually have to cope with modern transportation technology, cars, planes, trains, um, and so the grid cells could actually keep pretty good track for you. But now we have to rely much more heavily on the place cells to tell us where we are. So 
to calling our Kunstler, where am I? Geography of nowhere, perhaps. Um, so I would argue to you that buildings that look like this are actually the equivalent in terms of their placedness to strip malls, which all of us um, hate uh, universally. So, um, that previous building was in Chicago. This is a very similar language. You might uh, guess, I don't know, is it also in Chicago? In fact, this is, I think, Dallas. Um, and I would say, um, I'll note that these sorts of character-free designs are the grandbabies of mid-century modern pioneer um, or Boussier. He's the man who uh, basically invented urban renewal through sort of strip mining of um, vibrant working class communities and erecting um, the towers of the park in their place. It just so happens to be an emerging body of evidence that um, Le Boussier was not actually mentally well. I'll tell you about that over beers afterwards. Um, so neuroscience has also recently proven that we store and access our memories based on the places, and they have to be playful places, um, in which they were made. So this is an interesting fact. Um, placefulness doesn't take much. So you're probably not going to be surprised to learn that these buildings are in Oak Park. You probably just saw them. Um, and if you think back to the um, example of the Cudley building that Jim showed, um, I want you just think about how 95% of any architect who went through architecture school has actually had the sensibility trained out of them, and if anything, they um, think of these sorts of places as quaint and pastiche, and you shouldn't be doing it anymore, even if you could, and they don't think you can. Or the buildings are going to be being designed by you know, a 60-year-old builder who um, unironically wears a plaid and probably drinks Coors out of cozies. So <laughs> I would just say, while it is, of course, critically important to make the numbers work, when it comes to realizing middle housing or infill, please um, give sufficient care or thought um, when it comes to your design decisions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So we've got number three coming up on our cha schedule. Um, Ana Margarita Irizarry, who is a law project manager at uh, Lucha, a Latin United Community Housing uh, Association. As part of Lucha's mission, uh, Ana Margarita represents clients that have different housing needs. Currently, she works with clients that help, need help with eviction court and landlord-tenant negotiations, represent first-time home buyers and residential closings, and does outreach and education on fair housing issues. Ana has also been part of uh, key organ organizing coalitions around housing, including um, uh, preservation of affordable units on the 606, on which she is here to tell us about today. She is a passionate advocate for her clients, and she believes housing is a human right. Anna, you are up. Bear with me because I'm really chatty, and I don't know if I'm going to make it, but we're going to try. So today we're going to talk about the 606 Demolition Ordinance for serving naturally occurring affordable housing. We might disagree on the term, some say market driven. But today we're going to talk about uh, the communities that are going to be affected by this proposal that we've entered. Um, you know, when we think about Humble Park and Logan Square, we think about, you know, the flag, the actual square, the transit, the people that live in the community. What kind of housing type was there? Uh, before this whole gentrification happened. They had the typical frame housing, two to six flats. Um, this has ugly stucco, but it's a brick home that has like lower units at the bottom. This is what used to be prevalent in Humble Park and Logan Square. Now, after the year 2000 or at the end of the 1990s, gentrification started and this is what we have now. Lovely, isn't it? Um, please note the sarcasm. Uh, so, you know, I don't think I could find a better picture of the mica, you know, in front of the family dollar and then the horrid building. Um, so the changing housing stock has completely, the naturally occurring affordable housing has been basically destroyed and it's constantly being decimated and in re it's being replaced by single family luxury homes that are worth millions of dollars. Whereas before, Three families used to live, now one lives. Um, there's obviously been a housing boom along the 606. 
this is along on the Wicker Park Bucktown end, um, and then these are other developments around the 606. Again, all luxury because apparently that's what everyone wants, or a very small part of the population. Um, now, here you're going to see the communities affected by gentrification. Anywhere that's really dark, it's between uh, the number of units that have been built since the 1970s up to the year 2000. As you can see, Puerto Ricans used to actually live in Lincoln Park, and then they had to move because of gentrification. And as they move, gentrification follows them. Um, and in reality, once the community is gentrified, it never really recovers, okay? It just changes its character, its nature completely, which is why the Puerto Rican community raised the flags on Division Street to say, you know what, we're not leaving. Unfortunately, they are. Um, so a lot of the 606, I did not show any pictures, but it used to be blighted and basically gross. Um, it was abandoned, bad things happened along the 606, so the community is organized and created this lovely green space where people can congregate, exercise, commute safely, uh, but then they have to fight to stay in the neighborhood, okay? Um, once they finally get the 606, what happens? Everyone likes it and everyone wants to move in. Uh, so now we've had to organize to say to people, no, we want to stay, to let our <coughs> aldermen, to let developers know that we as a community wish to remain in the community. A coalition was created, really, uh, Logan Square uh, Neighborhood Association, LSNA, are really the leaders in this. We are just part of the coalition. LSNA deserves all the credit. Uh, and, you know, they've partnered with us with Center for Changing Lives, with the Blue Native Trail, and even Trans Active Trans Alliance joined. Um, so creating an ordinance. Creating an ordinance requires, many of you might know this, um, requires a lot of meetings, a lot of organizing, and getting your partnerships in line, whether it's meeting with your alderman who's gonna enter your proposal, um, getting the data, and getting an attorney to write the actual ordinance for you because the develop, uh, aldermen actually want you to hand them the written ordinance. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what we proposed. Uh, the 606 demolition ordinance uh, looks to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing by imposing larger demolition fees, um, by imposing a, uh, fees if you rezone or if you extend your building five more than 500 square feet. And this is the area along the 606 um, that we're trying to protect. So it's basically um, around like a half a mile, it's like Western and Costner and, and Hirsch and Palmer um, and stuff. Uh, the areas uh, protected. Um, the property owners, what can property owners do? They can still sell their property, they can still upgrade, they can still do whatever they usually did. It's just that if you decide to demolish your house, there's gonna be a larger fee um, in the hopes to dissuade um, any more demolitions. What does trigger the ordinance? What I've already mentioned. Um, expanding your building or your home by more than 500 square feet, uh, demolishing your home or rezoning. Um, and there is a fee attached to it. It starts at um, $300,000 or $350,000, which is about what it costs to replace an affordable unit. Um, who would manage the funds? Sorry, I took that picture just because it had like blue channel and a in the back and the aldermen. So it would be a coalition. It would be people, it would be a trust fund created and the aldermen would have a say, but also plenty of community organizations would be involved as well as residents in managing the trust funds. Um, the money from the trust fund would actually be used to either help preserve property owners that live in the community, make the repairs necessary so they can stay, because a lot of these older uh, structures need major repairs and people just can't simply afford to make the repairs, um, or to actually create new affordable units. Um, well, the ordinance was entered um, and it's stuck in committee at this present moment, that is um, really unfortunate. The city is currently saying they are they're finding some issues with the legality of it. But we all know that if the city of Chicago wanted to do something, it would have already been passed. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been community outreach and, and public hearings held from the point of view, you know, held by the community organizations to further educate uh, property owners and let them know that no, we're not telling you not to sell your house, you can sell your house. And in fact, property owners, when they sell their house to another individual versus a developer, they actually make more money. So we're also protecting even property owners. Um, 
When what are we doing right now? We're waiting. We're doing as much outreach as we can to let other people know that this is a good idea and to advocate for the preservation of these units. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is uh, Marty Cerny of, uh, of Housing Plus. He's a uh, president of Housing Plus. Uh, as, in his role as president, Marty brings a deep understanding of the housing crisis, the impediments to fair housing, and housing issues facing people with disabilities. Uh, experience supports him a vital, thorough understanding of the private sector landlord community, um, a key constituency in the uh, creation and development of this Housing Plus model. Um, this Housing Plus model works with participating built building owners and identifies um, underutilized spaces within those buildings. And he has been able to use that model to create um, new affordable housing, including fully ADA compliant uh, units in existing buildings. Pretty cool model. Um, Marty, you are, uh, you are up. Hello, we're good. Uh, I'm going to tell you my story. It's, uh, the first part of it is bright, the second part is kind of dark. The, uh, my mission is to work with the private sector landlord community to create uh, housing plus units um, on a per project basis until I can bring it up to scale. There is a massive amount of unproductive space all throughout Chicago and the region. It comes with two different flavors, um, commercial zone properties in particular. That's not necessarily a new idea, but I'll get into this a little bit more. Uh, in at least research in Chicago suggested that there's 700 linear miles of uh, retail space, unproductive retail space for which uh, there's no demand. I had a project at Evanston on the left. Retail space on the first floor was wasted. We had six units. We included 1,500 square feet of the garage. Changed the bar to uh, to family size units. You know, the other uh, space is in residential buildings from two flats to big courtyard buildings. And there's thousands of those in suburban Cook County. Um, so what am I saying? So um, it's a value proposition for owners. Uh, these spaces are unproductive. They'll spend the money. No public funds required. They'll build out the units. They'll designate them for affordable populations. And also because they're so close to grade, they can either be fully accessible or at a minimum, uh, they can be easily visible and, uh, and livable for people with modest mobility difficulties. So we got all kinds of buildings. There's over 86,000 candidate properties in the city. 86,000. Oh, so 75% uh, of those are within 660 feet of an L stop or a uh, uh, bus stop. And at 35% of those, we can have at least one ADA compliant unit. Uh, those red dots mean suggested. Those are the buildings that are candidate buildings. Uh, just a sampling, um, the 47th Ward, uh, which is, includes uh, Lincoln Square, that has the greatest density of candidate buildings. Uh, I'm likely a candidate for Alderman 47th Ward in the next election. Uh, so, on to the next one. You know, this is a, right by where I live uh, in Andersonville. Just within 600 feet of a bus stop, I figured we could do, there were, we could do eight 88 compliant units spread out over 23 properties. We could add um, a lot of units. They're all over the place. So um, that's the good news. In order to get this done, because uh, these properties are legal, non-conforming, or there needs to be a change in usage, you need a uh, local elected official to support. You need a zoning change if you're going to add units. Uh, eventually, it winds to uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals. Every project is fair housing outreach because pretty much every alderman requires neighbors to chime in uh, because we're talking about a zoning change. 
Um, so I've imagined involving the real estate community, private sector landlords, to do this in a systematic way. I list my board of directors and my advisory board because it was easy for me to say every significant real estate membership organization is represented there. Link Park Builders Club, on and on, Chicago Association of Realtors, they're all there along with some advocates. So, real simple. Um, wait, not so fast. Beware of the empty suits. Uh, I've been in and out of City Hall and County. I've dealt with the state. I've been to Washington. I've never had anybody that I've met with lift a finger after the meeting. <laughs> because there's no housing prices. Um, in Chicago, the project approval process has become so cumbersome and expensively risky that property owners are dissuaded from participating. In a given project, an owner might have to be at risk up to $30,000 before he finally gets a decision whether he can go forward or not. So it's silly. Um, there was a, a report, the impediments of fair, uh, impediments to, uh, the analysis of impediments to fair housing suggests that government policies and procedures are one of the most common impediments. No kidding. Uh, I remember in grad school, uh, one lesson was avoid excusitis. I haven't seen that. Um, from Ida, I got too much administrative work. From the zoning department, parking's too important. Uh, from my favorite alderman, uh, I'll read it tomorrow. Uh, growth and beating tendencies of elected officials toward decision making. Procrastinating lip service, inertia, safe, sacred cows. I got samples, um, pathologically defensive. <laughs> so, um, I got a simple fix to the zoning code that would, that would reduce the process dramatically, um, like 3,000% 3, 3, in probably a year or so in processing time. It's been on the desk since March the 7th. And um, I didn't know what the easiest way to conclude this. This is a picture of me about nine years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Marty. I think you uh, you spoke well to a lot of the uh, barriers in our enabling environment that uh, <laughs> others uh, others have touched on earlier. So um, much appreciated. Um, next up, we have um, uh, uh, Diane uh, Lemus with uh, Community United. Um. Uh, Diane um, uh, is here to talk about much of the uh, amazing work they do. Uh, including the uh, Renters Organizing Ourselves to Stay Initiative Roots, which brings together key partners and serves as a successful, unique model to preserve affordable rental housing in gentrifying communities. And as I, I was telling um, Diane and the other folks before, um, um, during the break, you know, they're doing really important groundbreaking work focusing um, on the two flat and the four flat and all of those building types that are such a big percentage of our nationally free affordable housing. So I am uh, particularly uh, excited to, um, to hear from them. And um, I'll hand you the microphone. Okay. You're up. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Renters Organizing Ourselves to Stay, or ROOTS, is a Communities United initiative that aims to preserve affordable uh, affordability in areas of opportunity and help stop displacement. To understand roots, we would have to look back at what was happening to renters and uh, foreclosures. Luis and his family were renters living in a foreclosed building. The bank issued an illegal notice for him to leave in two weeks and boarded up his building while he and his family still legally lived there. Luis was one of many families that suffered terrible abuse. You can see his uh, apartment with a uh, boarded up with it on the window. 
Because of the horror stories we heard from renters living in foreclosed buildings, Communities United convened the Keep Chicago Renting Coalition, made up of organizations from across the city, with goals of increasing protections for renters living in foreclosed properties. After nearly two years, the KCRO Coalition celebrates the passage of the Keep Chicago Renting Law that protects renters in foreclosed buildings. The ordinance requires that banks either offer leases to renters or pay $10,600 relocation fee. Yay, and this was a, a hard fought battle. <laughs> after nearly two years, after nearly, oh, sorry about that. After the passage of the KCRO, we began to see cash investors scooping up our two and four flat buildings and deconverting them into very pricey single family homes. Again, we saw the displacement of longtime tenants. At our yearly housing retreat, CU leaders came together to identify the problem. How do we compete with these cash investors and put these foreclosed two to four flats into the hands of a mission-minded developer that would keep them affordable and stop the displacement of families? Ah, the birth of roots. We identified Chicago Metropolitan Housing Development Corporation as our roots developer and Enterprise Community Partners as our finance person that would provide upfront money to CMHDC to help purchase and rehab these two to fours, thus leveling the playing field with cash investors. Our own research identified Fannie Mae as owners of the most two to four flat foreclosed properties in the areas that CU represents. So we decided to focus on Fannie Mae properties and with our roots developer, try to purchase them at a price that would allow affordability. We would receive a weekly report from Lawyers Committee for Better Housing identifying these foreclosed two to four flats located in our area. CU leaders would then do door knocking to identify occupied properties, talk to renters, and mobilize them to stay in their homes. By organizing and talking to renters living in these buildings, we were able to collect data and stories to engage our elected officials to push Fannie Mae to sell these properties at a bigger discount. The first building that we purchased from Fannie Mae through our Roots Initiative came to be known as the Central Park Building. These families were two weeks away from eviction. Through grassroots organizing, they were allowed to stay in their homes, living in an area of opportunity, at a rent that was lower than what they were paying before. In order to scale up after the purchase of our first building, we needed to partner with the Cook County Land Bank. They would hold properties and help facilitate donation tax credits, which helps preserve these units as affordable. In the fall of last year, we held a press conference announcing our Roots victory with many major stakeholders. Through our Roots initiatives, we were able to preserve 42 units of affordable housing and stop the displacement of families. I mean, it wasn't easy to work with Fannie Mae, but they sent three people from Washington, D.C. to be at our press conference. <laughs> Not only are we preserving affordability for working families, CMHDC rehabs these units so that we are improving the quality of life for these families. Above, you can see how they look, and the bottom was with uh, CMHDC rehabbing them. These are, uh, these are the 18 properties purchased uh, by CMHDC through our Roots Initiative. This means that no less than 42 families have the opportunity to live in the area of their choice at the price that they can afford. Through Roots, we know we have a product that works. However, we missed out on acquiring many properties that were too high priced for CMHDC to purchase and keep affordable. We are now partnering with Preservation Compact to identify strategies so that we can continue to purchase and preserve our two to fours and affordable, purchase and preserve two to fours as affordable and stronger markets. Some of these new strategies are financing tools for developers to purchase two to fours, home ownership, legalize basements and create basement units, energy efficiency, 
engage other roots developers and identify additional communities to preserve. As we move to phase two of roots, we look to continue to work to, work to preserve our Tudor forest. However, as we see investors purchasing our bigger buildings, our 30 to 40 units, displacing longtime renters, exactly what we were experiencing with our Tudor forest. So we see the need to purchase and preserve the bigger buildings as well. So through Roots, we are partnering with Celadon to preserve 12 buildings uh, on Chicago's northwest side, 415 units of housing that would be preserved as affordable, keeping families in their homes, schools, and communities at rents they could afford. Roots came from the ideas of everyday people that have faced or are facing displacement themselves. These community, community leaders know the importance of safe, affordable housing in areas of their choosing. Roots gives them an opportunity to have this choice. And if you are really thinking about ending segregation, then you must, must learn a way to uh, preserve affordable housing in areas that are gentrifying. And again, Roots does this. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more coffee shop for you. Um, we've had a lot of perspectives this afternoon's session, and we'd like to uh, conclude by taking it local and um, uh, giving the development perspective from uh, Chris Dillian of Camel Coil. Uh, as president of Camel Coil, Chris leads sustainable development and district scale revitalization efforts, producing highly transformative real estate projects in a growing number of urban and microurban communities. His past work includes the development of over 2 million square feet of retail, residential and mixed use real estate, including Parker Court, um, which has transformed Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood uh, into a south side destination. Current projects include District House, a mixed use condominium development in Oak Park. Um, I'd like to introduce Chris. You're up. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I've enjoyed the uh, presentations throughout the day and the panelists earlier. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a smaller project. So we do have District House, which is just a couple blocks east of here. Uh, it, we're, and we got involved with a, a project, um, the southeast quadrant of Oak Park in the Arts District. And uh, something kind of interesting. It's a, it's a small project for us, but we were really compelled by it. So. Um, the project is a partnership between my company and Rainquist Development. We're also working on the District House project together. And lastly, we're working with a group that acquired uh, this portfolio in the Arts District, uh, Distress. And so uh, it's a, a portfolio of about 40,000 square feet of retail. Uh, <coughs> Sorry about this. That's all right. I'm just going to keep going. So. Uh, <laughs> The, the whole format of 20 slides in 20 seconds kind of freaked me out anyway. So, uh, I can go. Uh, all right, so anyway, so I'm just um, I apologize, everyone. Um, so, so we, uh, I, I'll spend more time providing some context then. So our, our partners acquired this uh, distress, about 40,000 square feet of retail space. This is not a primary or secondary retail street. This is Harrison Street. It's the Arts District. It's a funky, quirky little uh, pocket of retail in the community. And so they listed it and marketed it for about a year and got nowhere. So we came in and said, we think we can do something interesting and compelling with this. So we came up with a tactical toolkit uh, and a vision for how we were going to transform the area. Uh, obviously in an environment where retail is very challenged right now, and I think that's only going to get worse, places like this uh, are, are really uh, in for um, challenges on the horizon, right? Uh, and so we came up with sort of a, a creative vision uh, with our architects, ISA out of Philadelphia, uh, that incorporates a variety of different tactical strategies, what we call the intervention, uh, to, to really try to reconceptualize the area, add new life, 
uh, and, and do something different. Now, one of the components of that is a new construction residential project that we're, we call Flex House. Uh, and that project uh, comes on the heels of two uh, similar projects in the Logan Square neighborhood uh, that were completed by my partner, Rankless Development. And so this is a, a uh, sort of a diagram showing the north side of the street. There are two historic or historically significant buildings. We call them the bookend buildings. And then the, the new construction flex house project is four units that's sort of bookended by those two buildings. Uh, we also control a building across Lombard Street. So you've got Harrison there, and then Lombard is the north-south. The site is one block away from the Austin Blue Line stop. So we looked at this and we said, this is really exciting. This is a transit-oriented uh, environment, and it's a block away. It's just really sleepy. So most of these buildings have been vacant for about 30 years. Believe it or not. So kind of crazy. So then on the south side of the street, we control all of these, these beautiful, there's three bow trust buildings. Uh, each of them are about 6,000 square feet. And then there is an old retail building. Believe it or not, the facade fell off a few years ago. So it looks like a uh, cruddy uh, retail strip center that you'd see in you know, any random suburb. So again, that underscores the need for the tactical intervention. We're going to do what we can on budget to improve and enhance uh, the facade of that. And so given that it's an arts district, given that this stuff has been vacant for about 30 years, uh, we're sort of coming at this with a sort of a maker strategy, thinking that that's sort of an extension of the arts district. And one of the ideas was we want to infuse the area with new construction, but we have too much retail space. So we knew we needed to go with a residential uh, application and we're sort of doing a live work light uh, uh, application. And what I mean by that is it's not technically zoned for live work, uh, but the idea is that this is the arts district. So if you want to have a potting shed in your backyard, or if you want to have an artist studio in your backyard, if you want to convert the ground floor of your flex house into your studio, that we have the functionality and capability to do that. I don't know where the site plan went, but it would be up there. Um, so, uh, so suffice it to say, there are two significant, historically significant buildings that bookend four row homes. And we call them row homes because the garages are detached from the, uh, from the actual building itself. Uh, there are three stories. Uh, the ground floor incorporates your living, dining room, and kitchen. Uh, again, we have sort of a strategy or vision, and again, that's where the floor plan would go if it were up there. Uh, I swear it was there when I put these slides together. Uh, so so the, uh, the idea, again, is that we can sort of create a demarcation between kitchen and living and dining and activate that ground floor if you are an artist and you want to have a home studio. Um, here are some precedent images. These are from the projects in Logan Square. They don't look like the projects that were referenced earlier, though they are modern, Elizabeth. Uh, so maybe something's a little crazy in my head, but yes, we, we, we tend to do modern projects. And so, uh, so Logan Square sort of provided proof of concept. Uh, my partner did about 50 units out there. Um, I was attracted to this project. Um, the, the Flex House project's about a $2 million total budget. Uh, the broader retail development, uh, all told, with Flex House is about $5 million. So that's a, that's a small project for us. But what attracted me to this is that, one, we're, we're sort of delivering something that um, it, it doesn't really exist in the marketplace. And when I talk to other municipalities, they get really excited about what this could mean. Uh, and, and it's appealing to a demographic that um, often doesn't uh, find the, the type of housing that they want in these communities. So I, I think this very much is uh, the, the missing middle in that regard. Um, the, the, in terms of where we are, we haven't broken ground yet. We're, uh, we're in the process. And so I, I, Tammy was uh, one of the speakers earlier. So I have to emphasize that we, we need one variance. Um, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the zoning that the village just passed under the previous zoning, we would have had to have gone through the plan development process. Under the new zoning, we need one 
rear yard setback variance. So I think that just goes to show how the planning uh, and zoning process at the village level is actually helping to facilitate things like this uh, to happen. Uh, so I think that's a really good sign and something that, uh, uh, you know, that's what zoning should do. They, zoning should make it difficult to do the wrong thing and easy to do the right thing. So uh, I believe this, hopefully you all agree, this is trending in the right direction. Um, you may be at, so I don't know if I mentioned, but we, these are for sale units. Um, they start at 539.9 and uh, go to 549.9. We have four units, so there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room to differentiate. Um, we actually sold out in about 39 days. Uh, so now we are looking at those two bookend buildings and thinking about doing a live work kind of riff on this, but a little bit more uh, intentional around the work side. Uh, and selling those as well. Uh, and we're looking for additional opportunities. Um, I, I recognize a lot of the previous speakers a moment ago talked about affordable housing. Uh, I can tell you from, from my experience, you know, this is not the type of project, especially given the size of it, where the developer gets rich. Um, it's interesting, it's fun, uh, it's an exciting project because I think our goal is to be able to replicate this. But uh, we really can't build it much cheaper than for 539 or 549. So that's kind of an interesting observation on our construction market and sort of where things stand today. My partner Bob, when he built his uh, the predecessor projects to this in Logan Square, they were around 449 uh, starting. And so that just gives you a sense, and that was a few years ago, that gives you a sense on how much construction costs have gone up uh, in this current cycle. So it's, it's pretty uh, uh, profound, that I would say. Um, here are a few renderings just on kind of the projects. You can actually barely see the Flex House project there, the, the bookend building. The, some of the tactical ideas, we're painting these buildings, we're adding a metal channel that sort of uh, draws them together. We've got signage standards uh, and, and different lighting ideas. The, the Flex House project, you'll see it in a moment, has sort of this screen element across the front. And the idea is that this is, uh, a, this is the transition between retail and residential, right? So it's really emphasizing that, that live-work aspect. So here you see the two-story historic building. Uh, right now, we're, we're sort of going down two parallel paths. We're trying to lease that ground floor space. We, we'd love to get a coffee user in this. Then we've got another concept where we're doing a second floor apartment. And then we're also uh, testing the idea of potentially taking these to market as live work units and selling those separately now that we've sold out uh, the four row homes. So the row homes are adjacent. That screen concept is on the ground floor. Uh, we are going to be going before the Zoning Board of Appeals on November 1st and uh, hopefully we'll get the one variance we need. We're going in for permit shortly, and our goal is to break down by the end of the year. This gives you a sense on just kind of the, the idea across the street where we've got these beautiful boat trust buildings, adding catenary lighting, doing some murals. Again, that metal channel sort of pulls us together, um, painting of some of the buildings, including the one with the sort of terrible facade. Uh, but then we've got some you know, beautiful limestone facade. We are talking with the brewery and with other really unique maker uses. Uh, and then this is sort of a, a direct look at the Flex House project that I mentioned. So you know, some of the ideas here, we have a, the ability to add signage. So if there's a home studio and they want to add signage, there's uh, the ability to do that. And then, of course, some, some of them may just live as residential units, and that's okay too. So it's flexible, it's efficient, it's modern. Uh, our hope is building from here that we're able to uh, find more opportunities to do these types of projects. And uh, we're, we're excited by uh, this opportunity. And this is uh, what I hope is a, a long term relationship with the Village of Oak Park. They're a great group to work with. What's the cost per square foot turn out to be for that? Uh, hard cost? No, yeah, hard yeah, hard cost for about 145 bucks a foot. Yeah, well, yeah so. that, that I just want to underscore because I, I, I want to just again underscore the, the con this is our tension. Right? That's why I couldn't leave the panel conversation without talking about construction costs. At $145 a square foot, which I know is a thin, real thin deal. 
I've, I have construction costs. I don't have your your market issues here in Chicago. We have issues in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We don't have your issues. I'm looking at $145, $150 a square foot in my market. My market's probably 20% less intense than your market is right now. So $145 is a skin deal. So, we have, so, so that we have to have a conversation about construction costs because if that's as low as we can go, that's as low as we can go. So that, that's, a, that's an immovable object. I just want to underscore that because constantly I go to places, they say, well, it's not affordable. Well, tell us how much less we'd like to play our construction workers or how much more we need to actually real solution. We need more tradespersons so that the few construction workers we have uh, aren't, de aren't demanding the market rates they can demand because there's more work then there is people to do the work. Mm -hmm. and we, can't, we can't make housing more affordable to solve that problem. Sorry, thanks, Kai. I guess I just have to say that, because when we have this, I want to make sure that that tension from the last three presentations doesn't go un, un, unimagined, because this, this is, these are two immovable objects. We can't have affordability and construction costs that continue to rise 450 to 550 in three years based on construction costs. Not based on somebody making a bid. You guys got to get around that. No, thank, thanks a lot. And um, I think with that, I want to thank all of you um, for attending uh, attending for the day and being part of what uh, we really hope was a, a really rich and wonderful session on um, on the missing middle. Um, so we're done with our program, but we're really hoping that today can be the beginning of a community. Um, and a, a long-term discussion on how to build and preserve and protect um, this building type. And there's no better way to begin a community than over drinks at happy hour. Um, we are indeed having a happy hour. Um, and we're walking over in a couple of minutes to um, a new tap room at Two Brothers. It's about a five-minute walk from here um, on 100 South Marion. Uh, myself and um, uh, Katie from the board will be walking over there with you together. I really want you all to come, um, be part of the conversation, um, have a couple of drinks, debrief on the day. Um, we can go over our learning objectives and lessons learned then. Um, in the meantime, thank you all for coming and um, see you at happy hour.